with an increase of motor vehicle fatalities and injuries involving Delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol, which is the active ingredient in marijuana. Senate Bill 117 sets a baseline scientific standard of five nanograms in a DUID driving case. If a driver has over five nanograms of tetrahydrocannabinol, Delta 9, in their system, they would be considered driving under the influence of drugs, per se. I think what we should do is cut to the chase um, and get to why we're here and why we're spending our time uh, looking at this. In a February 23rd, 2012 uh, article, Marijuana Advocates Prepare to Fight THC Driving Bill. One of the critics of this bill, Democratic Senator Morgan Carroll of Aurora, told our Michael Roberts back in January that if she still has not seen enough scientific support to prove the nanogram love limits. I've seen ranges from 5 to 25 nanograms, which is a profound range variation, she noted. And it's already against a lot of drive intoxicated. So if you're going to add pot per se, it's because you think you have enough scientific data to establish a point where people can become impaired. She later said that if you observe driving in a way that shows you're impaired, you can be prosecuted. This is just a shortcut where the prosecution doesn't have to offer any proof of impairment. The per se limit means that they can pick a magic number, and in this case, it would be magic, not science. And then, they don't have to provide any evidence of actual impairment. That is the issue. That is the issue that you're to look at. The science. I would like to uh, present uh, that there is very solid scientific base the five nanograms and someone driving with more than five nanograms puts the citizens of our state at risk. We had intended on calling a world-renowned expert on this issue, Professor Dr. Jan Ramaker. Dr. Ramaker is a professor the Public University of Maastricht in the Netherlands. We had planned on Skyping uh, Dr. Ramey here so he could testify and answer your questions. We were limited um, by technology. I am going to present uh, Dr. Jan Ramaker's information. Dr. Ramaker from 2009 to present, is a professor occupying an endowed chair of behavior and toxicology of medicine, drugs, and drug abuse at the Public University of Maastricht in the Netherlands. From 2007 to present, Dr. Ramaker heads the Department of Neuropsychology and Physicality at Maastricht University. 2006 to present, he is Assistant Treasurer of International Council on Alcohol and Drug and Traffic Safety. 2006 to present, he is the Associate Professor, Faculty of Psychology, Neuroscience, Department of Neuropsychology and Pharmacology at the Maastricht University. 2005 to present, Coordinator Research Master Track, Neuropsychology, Faculty, Psychologist, Maastricht University. 2004 to present, faculty member Robert F. Borkstein Center for Studies on Law in Action, Indiana University, Bloomington, USA. 1998 to 2006, assistant professor of faculty of psychology and neuroscience, Department of Neuropsychology, Maastricht University, University of the Netherlands. 1998, doctor, behavioral technology, Toxicity of Medicine and Drugs, defended November 19, 1998. The doctor has produced 72 publications in reference to these issues. 
I have a copy of um, his testimony and also his um, information. <coughs> Dear Dr. Rounders, as you're aware, we are trying to establish the THC DUID per se level for whole blood in Colorado. As a part of, as a part of this effort, we have been asked to provide a scientific basis for the level of 5 nanograms THC in whole blood. It is my understanding that you will not be able to testify remotely at this hearing. Since you will not be able to testify at this hearing, Cindy Burbach and I have put together a list of questions that we hope you can answer, which will provide information to the committee. We believe that the questions and your answers are critical uh, to this legislation. If it is possible for you to answer these questions by the 22nd of February, it would be appreciated. Question number one, based on your research and experience in the field of toxicology, do you believe a whole blood THC level of five nanograms generally causes impairment? Answer, yes. Exper experimental research, i.e. Ramkers ETAL 2006, has demonstrated that THC produces performance impairment in a concentration-related manner. Objective signs of impairment are already measurable between two and five nanograms serum whole blood. In isolation performance domains and becoming overtly present in a larger range of performance domains between 5 and 10 nanograms serum whole blood. In addition, epidemiological studies have also confirmed that THC increases crash risk in a concentration dependent manner. Several studies indicate that crashes, culpability, impairment risk increase over two to five nanograms in whole blood. Drummer, ETAL 2004, Kabali, ETAL 2006, Lamont, ETAL 2005, Kuipers, ETAL 2012. Question. A number of states have adopted per se DUI legislation for DUI D, THC. You have mentioned in some of your research that the levels of THC in whole blood and plasma that the toxicology community is recommending for DUI and DUID per se, based on your research, do you think that 5 nanograms THC in whole blood is a reasonable DUI per se limit? Answer, yes. See also my answer to question one. Question number three. Does your research support the idea that frequent users would generally have a baseline THC level in whole blood that is less than 5 nanograms? Answer. Research in chronic cannabis users indicate that their res residual baseline THC levels are generally below 5 nanograms in whole blood. Ramakers ETAL 2008, Ramakers ETAL 2010, Schwank ETAL 2009, Kirchhofer ETAL 2009. Question number four. Is there a scientific difference between frequent recreational marijuana users and frequent medical marijuana users? Answer, no. The body does not distinguish between medical or recreational use of TV. Question number five. Do you have an opinion on whether a frequent or chronic user develops tolerance to the euphoric and impairing effects of marijuana? Answer. Chronic users do not develop tolerances to the euphoric feeling or being high and the physiological increase in heart rate, drop in blood pressure, effects of THC. Chronic users do, however, become tolerant for many other performance impairment effects of THC. However, this behavior tolerance does not occur or may not be complete in each and every chronic user as a result of research 
which has suggested that 20 to 25 percent of chronic users still demonstrate significant driving impairment after a single dose of THC. Bonkers, ETAL 2012. Moreover, a tolerance does not pertain to all performance domains. Chronic users were shown to have more decision errors in task measurement and pulsing behavior. Ramakers, ETAL 2006. These findings were recently corroborated by my research in a large sample of chronic users. Question number six. It has been said here in Colorado the current research is inconclusive and insufficient to establish a scientific base DUID THC level. Based on your research and your knowledge of the current research on the subject, do you think that there is sufficient research to scientifically support a DUID per se level in general, and specifically a level of 5 nanograms THC in whole blood? Answer, yes. Question number seven. Should per se levels protect the population at large, or should they distinguish impairment from non-impairment in each and every individual driver? Answer, this is the decision your courts have to make. The U.S. appears to be much more sensitive over this issue than is the case in Europe. Let's take alcohol and let's as an example. We all accept the fact that alcohol increases crash risk and that we should try to protect the general public from individuals who drink and drive. Consequently, initially legal limits for alcohol, and they have been, we have initiated illegal limits for alcohol, and they have been very successful in reducing alcohol related accidents and fatalities. However, the association between alcohol and crash risk pertains to the general sample of drivers, but not necessarily to the individual. The individual driver. From the general association, we can only infer that the individual driver is at an increased risk of crash, but not his or her actual state of impairment. Occasional use may be more sensitive to alcohol than daily drinkers who may be actually develop some tolerance for the impairment of crash. Should we use this knowledge to reverse our alcohol limitations? Question. Why are the European countries per se levels so much lower than the levels generally seen in the United States? Answer, it probably depends on whether a country adheres to impairment of per se level laws. The Netherlands, for example, rules impair laws and tries to set the most limits above which impair impairment is evident. Currently proposed is three nanograms in serum. Other EU countries that rule per se laws seek analytical detection limits the per se of THC to one nanogram. Two more questions. Question number nine. Often, Dr. Grotenheimerman is referenced as saying that THC levels do not correlate to driving impairment. As a co-author of a peer-reviewed research with Dr. Grotenheimerman, do you agree with this assessment of his research? Answer. Then Dr. Grotenheimerman has been referenced incorrectly. In this particular paper, we presented an exploratory relationship between THC concentrations and fatal culpability risks. Grotenheimer's paper was actually sponsored by NORML who since this report has admittedly agreed to the fact that cannabis increases crash risks. It is my understanding, question number 10, it is my understanding you have current research where you're looking at chronic users of marijuana. Is there any relevant information surrounding DUID per se levels or impairment that you can share regarding this use? Answer C, question um, five. Professor Ramaker would like to be here to be able to share his vast research and his vast knowledge. And obviously, with him being in Netherlands, um, we're limited from a technological standpoint. I think this goes a long way to talking about 
the scientific basis that Senator Carroll had questions about. And we will be presenting other scientists that will confirm Dr. Grammaker's information. And Mr. Chair, with that, I would ask that we go to witnesses. Now, if I may, uh, there has been uh, expressed a number of times by Mr. Wilson, uh, Mr. Elliott, Mr. Alexander, this very concern of the fact that if we pass this law, there are going to be, you know, people who are going to be unfairly charged and convicted with this. Now, in a lot of the examples that get put forward here, they're missing some essential steps. And that is, is that if an officer wants to contact a driver, number one, they have to have reasonable suspicion of probable cause. They have to see something which is going to cause them to pull them over. Now, it could be something innocuous. It could be expired license plate. It could be a busted tail lamp or something like that. But if the officer contacts the driver, it's at that point they have the additional requirement that they have to establish probable cause that that driver is under the influence before any of this takes place. They have to establish some sort of basis to believe why that person is impaired. This notion of people are getting pulled over and they are stone cold sober, there's not a single indication that they can't drive, that situation won't play out. Now, if you don't trust the law enforcement officer or the prosecutor to make that judgment, the next phase wouldn't necessarily be the judge. Even if you had a result, assuming arguendo, if you listen to the, uh, the opponents, and somebody were over five nanograms of delta-9 THC, but there's no indication of impairment, a judge is going to evaluate that on a motion to dismiss for lack of probable cause and say, where's the impairment here? So what I've repeatedly heard is the scenario where people are going to be ensnared by this law. There are too many protections along the way in order to ensure that. 